In the spring of the year 2000, a married woman began having an affair with a man doing her home improvement. But only a few months later, this little fling led to a horrific and deadly ending. This is the case of Adele Craven. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also horse racing. Did I mention I'm the horse? But anyways, today we're going over the case of Adele Craven, a heartless woman who conspired to do away with her husband, but didn't anticipate what would come next. For our story, we're heading to Edgewood, Kentucky. Edgewood, Kentucky is a city in Kenton County with a small population of around 8,600 people. It's home to a few large parks, and its motto is, every day is a walk in the park. Overall, the town is affordable, cozy, and has a considerably low crime rate. But if you ever find yourself here, there's plenty of cool things to do. You can visit Pioneer Park where, located next to a creek, is a paved walking path and some beautiful natural scenery. You could race your way into full throttle adrenaline and do a bit of go-karting, axe throwing, and much more. You could hop on a sea vessel at BB River Boats and get taken on a tour of the city from the perspective of a boat. You could even roll on over to Strike and Spare, a bowling alley that reminds me of the time that I was a professional bowler. Ball is actually hitting the approach before the lane. Oh, good lord. It was a long time ago, but unfortunately, despite how fun all of these activities sound, none of them are the reason as to why we're in Edgewood today. Adele Vacuna Craven was born in 1963 in a working class area of Long Beach, California. Not much is known about her early life, but growing up her and her family had very little in terms of wealth and lived modestly. According to others, Adele was quiet, respectful, and well behaved as a child and this continued on into her adult years. So needless to say, what would happen in the future would come as a surprise to everybody. But around the year 1989, while Adele was attending school to be a mortician, she met a man training to be a pilot by the name of Stephen, and the two of them hit it off. And by the way, a mortician, or a funeral director, is someone whose job is to arrange funerals and prepare people for their wake, cremation, or burial. Stephen Craven was a member of the U.S. Coast Guard, and he seemed to have it all together. With a warm, charming personality and a good head on his shoulders, Adele found herself quite attracted to Stephen, and before long, the two of them got married in secret. Following this, the couple had a child, who we'll call David, in 1989. And three years after that, in 1992, they relocated to Edgewood, Kentucky, as part of Stephen's new job at Delta Airlines. For several years, this positive trajectory would continue here in Kentucky. The neighborhood the family lived in is known as Caramel Ridge, and for Adele and Stephen, it was really the perfect place to raise a family. To get an impression of the type of place Caramel Ridge is, well, just imagine a bunch of nice houses with well-trimmed lawns and neighbors throwing backyard barbecues. Adele and Stephen were good friends with the neighbors. They attended church on a weekly basis, and by all appearances, had a happy marriage. So naturally, Adele, who always wanted this type of life, and her husband, who worked hard to create it for his family, enjoyed it all tremendously, at least for a while. In 1995, Adele gave birth to another child who we'll call Matthew. And despite having a successful marriage for so long, Around the mid to late 1990s, Adele and Stephen's relationship started to become a bit rocky. Stephen's job as an airline pilot often kept him away from his wife and kids for long stretches of time. And as a stay-at-home mom, Adele was the primary one responsible for looking after the kids, so this put a tremendous burden on her. On top of all of this, 
Stephen didn't like that Adele frequently bought expensive items using his money, and he often criticized her for gaining weight. Still, when he was home, he tried his best to be a good father to the kids. And by all accounts, he accomplished that, even in spite of all of the problems he was having with his wife. But more and more, the couple began to get into fights and disagree over their issues. So at a certain point, they both agreed to seek counseling. These series of couples therapy or counseling appointments went quite well. And for a little while, the tension in their marriage faded into the background. However, privately, Adele was acting a lot different. Not only had she told friends that Stephen quote unquote made her skin crawl and that she wished his plane would crash, but she was thinking about trying to get a divorce and had secretly gotten her mother to send her $3,000 to pay for it. Because she didn't want to risk losing access to Stephen's income though, Adele changed her mind and this never ended up happening. But if it had, this would have saved a lot of bloodshed. Regardless, with his impression that things were going well again, Stephen agreed to treat Adele and the kids with a home makeover. Now, although the two parents were both relatively capable of doing home improvement on their own, they soon decided they needed some assistance. So in the spring of 2000, Stephen recruited a man he worked with by the name of Rusty McIntyre to help the family remodel their house. Rusty was a baggage handler at Delta Airlines, and he also did some handiwork on the side. Unbeknownst to Stephen, however, Rusty harbored dark secrets, including the fact that he suffered from serious psychological issues. With him being around the home, and Adele still trying anything she could to get out of her unhappy marriage, it was only a matter of time before the two of them became a deadly duo. And as for the consequences of that, well, they would be even worse than anyone ever imagined. So over the first few months of the year 2000, the Craven family's home makeover was going great. Their helper, Rusty McIntyre, had soon proved himself to be a very capable and effective handyman. But in addition to this, the long period of time he and Adele were now spending with each other led to two other separate things happening. One, they agreed to go into business together decorating people's homes. And two, they began having an affair. The latter of which was made even more awkward by the fact that Rusty was also married with kids. But having a business together gave Rusty an excuse to spend as much time with Adele as he wanted, and he soon bought her a cell phone in order for them to keep contact. And while Adele's motivations seemed to be more based on using Rusty in order to get him to do her dirty work, Rusty was genuinely in love with Adele. Meanwhile, Adele's husband, Stephen, had grown somewhat suspicious of her and Rusty's relationship, but he was too busy with his job as a pilot to do much looking into it, and before he even could, it was already too late. By the summer of 2000, Adele and Rusty's relationship had taken a dark turn. The sinister couple was now coming up with various schemes to murder Stephen Craven collect his $500,000 life insurance policy, and live happily ever after. Almost all of the ideas that they came up with involved an ambush, but just in different locations. One plan was to ambush Stephen while he was on his boat. Another was to ambush Stephen while he was on a bike trail. And the last was to simply ambush Stephen while he was at his home. At one point, Adele had even suggested that, given the opportunity, she would commit the murder herself. But in the end, they settled on a somewhat different method. But before we get into specifics though, let's get into how and when Stephen Craven was found murdered. So on the night of July 12th of 2000, Adele Craven had gotten home at around 8.30 p.m. and pulled into her driveway at her house in Caramel Ridge. Much of the day, she had spent running errands with her two children who were in the back seat of her car. But after parking and seeing that the door to her home was wide open, Adele claimed to have freaked out 
and went over to her next door neighbor, Julie Boyce's house for help. Adele spoke with Julie and told her she feared a burglary had taken place at her home. So in turn, Julie called her father and had him go over to the house to investigate. But when Julie's father went over, he discovered a gruesome sight. At first, doing a bit of probing of the house from the front, Julie's father went around the back and took a look inside from a basement window. From this vantage point in the window, Julie's father could see the bottom of the basement steps, and right away, he saw the body of an unidentified man sitting in a pool of blood. Immediately, he alerted Adele of this discovery and had her take a look into the window as well. However, following her peering through the window, she claimed to not recognize the identity of this person, even despite the fact that he was clearly wearing Stephen's clothing. So instead of freaking out about her husband dying, she stood on her neighbor's porch and gave them impression that she was panicking about a dead body being in her home. But following this terrifying revelation, the police were called and investigators arrived at the scene of the crime. Once they entered the Craven family's home and found the dead person lying at the bottom of the basement steps, they were quick to identify the body as being none other than that of Stephen Craven. However, his face was unrecognizable and the way that he was murdered was brutal. So right away, authorities began their investigation into what happened. And despite acting like she was in a state of shock and bewildered by the entire ordeal, one of the first people the police interviewed was of course Adele Craven. Meanwhile, her kids David and Matthew were looked after by her neighbor. Adele told police in a hysterical tone of voice that it must have been a burglary because no one wanted to kill Stephen. But police found themselves a bit skeptical of this notion simply because of some of the details of the case, including the fact that there were no signs of forced entry, there was no evidence of an intense struggle, nothing in the home was damaged or taken, and Stephen's wallet and credit card were untouched in a nearby room. By all appearances, this was just a cold-blooded murder. But then when police did a search in their database looking for any records of Stephen Craven, they stumbled across something rather interesting. While nothing came up for Stephen Craven himself, his wife Adele's name was in the database for a somewhat strange reason. According to records, some point within the prior few months, there was an incident where a local police officer was patrolling the area behind a church when he caught two people having in the back of a parked van. And surprise, surprise, as it turns out, these two people were Adele Craven and Rusty McIntyre. In addition, after authorities talked to Adele's neighbor, they soon learned that one, Rusty had been spending an exorbitant amount of time at the Craven family's home when Stephen wasn't there, and two, Adele and Rusty had been exchanging a lot of text messages and phone calls back and forth for the past few months. So naturally, the main suspects became Adele and Rusty. In fact, authorities couldn't find anyone else who even had connection to Stephen. But then, when they found another piece of physical evidence, it quickly put the handyman's nail in the mortician's coffin. And what this was, was a large bag packed with Adele's clothes, her children's passports and birth certificates, and $4,000 in cash. It appeared as if she was planning to escape. On top of this, a bunch of Adele's neighbors and friends came forth and said that she made comments to them about wanting her husband dead. So all in all, only eight days following the murder of Stephen Craven, police officially decided to place Adele Craven and Rusty McIntyre under arrest. With the only problem here being, at least in Rusty's case, that he had conveniently taken his family on a cruise during this period of time with the use of money Adele had given him. So yeah, they just had to wait until he returned to arrest him. But following their arrest, they each told police different stories. While Adele claimed that she had no knowledge of the murder and blamed the whole ordeal on Rusty, Rusty himself admitted to being involved 
but also implicated Adele along with a third person whose name we haven't mentioned yet. He also said that he had been off his medication for a while, was drinking too much, and in a state of depression. But for the next few years, Adele pleaded her innocence until finally confessing to murdering her husband. And what exactly happened on the night of Stephen Craven's murder went as follows. And just a warning, it's absolutely gruesome. So in the weeks before July 12th of 2000, Adele Craven and Rusty McIntyre devised their insidious plan to murder Stephen. But as opposed to doing it themselves, they ultimately agreed to hire a hitman. Not a professional one, but just a man Rusty knew by the name of Ron Pryor. Ron was a two-bit criminal and the type of person who would do anything for money. He would definitely be down for it if the reward was high enough. And so, after talking to him, Adele and Rusty agreed to pay Ron $15,000 in order to murder Stephen. Right away, Ron then accepted the offer, and before long, Rusty bought a gun, and the plan was set in motion. On the day of the murder, or July 12th of 2000, at 9 a.m., Rusty and Ron met up at a cemetery. There, they waited for a phone call from Adele, telling them when they could come and scout out the house. With the intention being to prep themselves up for the murder that was going to take place later that night. Meanwhile, inside the Craven family home, Adele and Stephen were discussing plans for a future vacation. Stephen had taken off work by calling in sick and was planning on traveling to New York with a friend that day to see a show on Broadway. As for the couple's young children, David and Matthew, well, they were being looked after by a neighbor. Now, originally, Adele intended to wait for Stephen to leave so that way Rusty and Ron could come over real quick and then go over the details for the murder, but instead, she changed her mind, called Rusty over the phone, and told him that they would have to go through with their plan immediately. And so Rusty got into his truck and started driving to the Craven family's home. Meanwhile, Ron Pryor, the hitman, had jumped onto the back of the truck and was now hiding there awaiting their arrival at the home. But once Rusty pulled up to the house, he then turned the music up on the radio as loud as possible, got out of his vehicle, entered the home, and told Stephen he had to come fix a faulty shower head in the basement. Around the same time, Ron snuck around the back of the home, went into the basement, and started hiding in a specific location where there was a mirror be able to catch Steven's movements. And then, while Ron was waiting, Adele lured Steven into the basement by telling him that their pet ferret was loose and that she needed his help to come find it. However, once Steven walked down the steps and entered the basement, Adele quickly opened up the basement door, went outside, and shut the door on her husband. Next, Ron came out from his hiding spot and hit Stephen in the head with a crowbar while Adele stood outside and watched from the window of the basement door. Now, despite Ron hitting Stephen in the head with a crowbar a dozen times and even fracturing his skull, he hadn't died yet. So realizing this, Adele handed Ron a 38 caliber handgun to finish the job. Ron then fired a single shot at Stephen's head as he lay dying near the bottom of the basement steps. And figuring that would be sufficient, Ron then began to change out of his clothes to swap them for a new set. But after going over to Steven's body and checking, Adele insisted that her husband was still breathing. So she reloaded the handgun and handed it to Ron once again and had him shoot Steven two more times in the head. And at that point, Steven Craven was officially dead. But after their evil plan had concluded, Adele informed Rusty about something she had learned while being a mortician. And that was that the longer it took authorities to find a body, the more difficult it was to determine the time of death. So with this in mind, all three perpetrators went their separate ways. Rusty in his truck, Adele in her car, and Ron on foot, presumably. And then Adele waited as much time as possible before returning to her home. In the meantime, though, she picked up her kids, drove up to the bank, and took out $4,000 from Stephen's credit card. 
Following that, Adele met up again with Rusty at a Verizon wireless store, helped him pay his delinquent phone bill, and handed him $1,000 to pay Ron Pryor. Afterwards, her and Rusty had lunch, and later on, Rusty then met up with Ron and gave him his money. Subsequently, Adele ended up returning home around 8.30 p.m., and as we already talked about, for the next several hours and years, she took on an acting job. But after police arrested Adele Craven, Rusty McIntyre, and Ron Pryor, and each of their respective trials concluded, the sentencing was as follows. For his part of the crime, Rusty McIntyre was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 25 years. Ron Pryor, the hitman, was originally sentenced to death, but later given life in prison without the possibility of parole. And last, but certainly not least, Adele Craven, the mortician and now widow, was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 20 years. It's notable to point out the fact that in Adele's case, she held out, as we've already mentioned, for years, three and a half years in fact, before finally admitting to being guilty. Before that time, however, she had convinced the jury so effectively with her quiet, soft-spoken, and sad demeanor that one jury was hung. But in the end, it became pretty clear, based on the evidence, that she was responsible. Not only did the version of events that Rusty and Ron gave of the murder independently line up perfectly, but the timeline of Adele dropping her kids off at a neighbor's and doing a bunch of chores lined up as well. On top of this, there were still all of the other evidence, like her packed bags, comments she made about her husband, etc., etc. So when all this was said and done, it was too much to ignore. And thankfully, Adele wasn't able to get away with her evil scheme. But what she did to her husband, Stephen, was still absolutely terrible. Stephen Craven was a good man, a good father to his children, and an excellent pilot. He certainly didn't deserve to be murdered in such a brutal way. I really hope he's resting peacefully. And by the way, if you're curious what happened to his two children after Adele was convicted, well, they were sent to live with Steven's brother and raised by him. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. I also have a second account with my brother named Horrorflying where we tell stories about everything paranormal. This includes true crime, mysteries, and things that are just downright Spooky. I'd greatly appreciate if you subscribe to that too. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.